Okay, I want to pull you guys back uh, for starting up our lab today, uh, which is about herps or herpetology. You guys probably know there's disciplines in biology like ornithology and mammalogy and ichthyology about birds, about mammals, about fishes. Herpetology is kind of this in-between ground for the tetrapods. Um, I hope you can look at this image and see very, very, very different lineages of reptiles. There is a anaconda, which is a huge boa, a huge snake wrapped around a black caiman, which is a crocodilian. You guys have seen the Triassic now. We've made our way through the Permian and the Triassic. We're about to be more in the Jurassic. Here's an archosauromorph. Here's a lepidosauromorph. And there they are interacting like today in South America. These are animals that frequently eat each other throughout their lifetimes. Caimans eat anacondas and anacondas eat caimans. You guys know these, if you want to think of them as something like as anthropomorphized as dynasties, go back all the way into the Triassic, lepidosaurs and archosaurs. And technically into the late Permian is when they diverge from each other. And there's these modern representatives living extremely different lives in the same habitats today. So thank you for going through this exercise and making a phylogeny. I'm not surprised at all it was challenging. I intentionally put salamanders, lizards, tuatara up top there. Here's crocs down here. That sort of vaguely sprawling fat tail body plan is the ancestral, the plesiomorphic, the shared body plan of tetrapods. So salamanders and lizards and crocodiles kind of look the same from their shared ancestry, but there's derived features that crocodiles share with birds, that turtles share with both of them, that frogs share with salamanders, that helps us see that they are different from each other. But there is a lot of, at a glance, similarity, right? Look at that gecko and look at that salamander. They are not at all closely related. The bird goes with the <laughs> gecko, the frog goes with the salamander. It's very interesting though, that these body plans make it hard for us sometimes to pull these animals apart. So thank you for working with your groups. Thank you for talking about how you make your phylogenies and thank you for putting your phylogenies on the board. I think it's only through like repeatedly trying this and challenging yourself that you'll get more and more comfortable with drawing these things. They're complicated diagrams. There's the one you've seen a million times with all the pictures you've seen a million times. And so we already kind of talked about it, right? Birds and crocs go together, that's archosaurs. Add turtles on there, they're kind of archosauromorph. When we were doing our Triassic lectures, you guys saw like a million crazy things that go right here. Today, there's three big clades that are still alive. You guys saw in the Triassic how much biodiversity on land there was in those archosauromorphs. Reptiles are monophyletic, right? There's a common ancestor for all the reptiles, and that includes birds. Then you got your mammals added onto the reptiles, that's amniotes. You got all your amphibians added onto that clade, that's the tetrapods with legs, animals on land, vertebrates on land. So this is very helpful. We can use this to test hypotheses. We can use these to interpret fossils. We can use these to like do science, a phylogeny of all these groups. But I really like this question. Imagine you're a 1700s naturalist like Linnaeus or something like that. Imagine you're in the 1800s before Darwin's done anything with evolution. These animals are all findable by you out in the world, but you don't really know how they go together. And so something that I think is very fun is before we had an evolutionary understanding of these organisms, humans, Western science, made these fields of study. Some of them are super nice. Ornithology means you study birds. Birds have feathers, they're on two legs, they have beaks, that's easy. Mammalogy means you study mammals. Mammals have fur and milk and hey, I'm a mammal and so are all my sheep and dogs and all this other stuff in my life. This one is the leftovers of tetrapods. If you take Dr. Peterson's herpetology class, I think you guys know this is a paraphyletic group of organisms. It's all the amphibians and all the reptiles that aren't birds. And depending on how you take herpetology, some people would include dinosaurs, which you guys now know are right here. Dinosaurs are on the bird side. Birds literally are dinosaurs. And some people include those early synapses like Dimetrodon with a sail on its back. Because herpetology, you can imagine when you don't have an evolutionary idea of how to put things together, it's like the furry guys, the feather guys, uh, slimy, scaly stuff that isn't a fish is herpetology. I always think that's sort of a funny and unfortunate thing. And so I wasn't surprised at all that you guys were able to try to think through where you put birds and where you put mammals. But when it comes to the interrelationships of these organisms, it's sort of like, ah, I don't know, <laughs> what can I even use? Hopefully in this class, you guys will get a better idea of that. So I wanna walk us through some of the details of the living herps, so herpetology. That's it. today's amphibians and today's non-avian reptiles. This is a paraphyletic thing. I don't love it, but it is how we work. Our department offers herpetology if you guys want to take it. And so on your slide, or sorry, on your sheets now, 
uh, or some place for you to take notes on some anatomy for these amphibians and these reptiles. So let's talk about the diversity that does exist today. You guys have already seen this a little bit. There's a ton of species of list amphibians today, more than 8,700 species, which is way more than there are species of mammal. All the mammals put together are in the 5,000s. List amphibians, 8,700 species. So most of those species are frogs, almost 7,700 species are in this clade called Anura. That's the crown group of frogs. There are other things that we would call frogs that are on the stem group. That one you already met, Triadobotrachus from the Triassic. That's a stem group frog. It's not technically an anurin. So frogs today, that's a lot of different species. Frogs do ecologically a lot of different things. They have a pretty derived body plan, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. They don't look like other organisms. You know a frog when you see a frog. There's over 800 species of salamanders. That's the name, technical name for the living clade, the crown group of salamanders. They have that kind of ancestral plesiomorphic body plan for tetrapods, four legs, long tail, kind of lizardy vibe, but an amphibian. And then you guys, of course, know your Sicilians, those wormy guys. The I always think of them as the amphibian snakes. They lost all their legs. They slither, slither around in like wet leaf litter. There's 200 some species of Sicilians. You guys got this on all your phylogeny, so good for you. This is the topology of relationships, the phylogeny of modern Lys amphibians. There is a monophyletic clade called Lys amphibia. That's the node. Sicilians are the offshoot, they're the outgroup to the other two. Salamanders and frogs go together in a clade that's called Batrachia, which I do not think I have given to you guys yet. Uh, we won't focus on it too much, but salamanders and frogs go together. We have good fossils for that. We have excellent genetics for that. That's how these three clades are related. I wanna focus in though on frogs today because they have some of the more interesting anatomy, especially for looking for bits and pieces in the fossil record. So I'm gonna give you guys a snapomorphy and this is a real joke of a snapomorphy for frogs because I'm trying to just, I could put nine, I'm just putting one because I wanna talk about all the different ways they have a very derived body plan and those adaptations are directly linked to how they locomote, how they move around. I don't think you have to be anywhere past kindergarten to know that like frogs hop, <laughs> that's how they move. And a lot of their anatomy helps them locomote in this way. So saltatory locomotion is jumping. There's our frog skeleton. Now you guys saw this when we did our first osteology lab and we're looking at the postcranial skeleton, right? The behind the head skeleton, the body skeleton. And there's a bunch of details that frogs have that I care for you guys to know. They have extremely short backs. So there's the frog skull. Sometimes as few as nine vertebrae in their whole, from their neck and their back together. This giant structure back here, this is their sacrum. And then all this long stuff here is their ilium, one of their hip bones. So frogs have humongously long hips, sometimes hips longer front to back than their actual vertebral column. That is a special vertebral element, the uracile, that is one element that goes from their sacral vertebrae, where the ilium is fusing, all the way down into the pelvis. Sometimes it's a little bit loose. In life, it's cartilaginously held there. But there's this midline element that is from the vertebrae called a urostyle. Definitely strengthens their pelvis because that's a pretty long and weird pelvis, very different from yours. I always think like, imagine if your hip bones that are right here were like up to here and this was all just guts. That's weird, right? Very different. They have a weird thing in their uh, mid limbs, their forearms and their shins, where they fuse up the bones. Their radius and their ulna are fused. You guys will look, you'll see a humerus, one bone in the upper arm. You look in the second part of the arm, the forearm, instead of two bones, you're just gonna see one because that radius and that ulna are fused up. And the same is true in their distal leg in the mid, their shin. Um, after the femur, which is one bone as usual, there's another one bone. That's because they have a tibia and they have a fibula that through their life fuse up. And so it's one long element. Several of you noticed when we had our osteology lab that their foot is different. There's like an extra joint there. And that joint looks like it has two bones. It looks like a tibia and a fibula. It's not. Those are tarsal bones that are elongated. So a frog's hind limbs have like three major structural units before you even get to the foot. Most of us vertebrates on land have two units and a hand, two units and a foot. They've got three units because they've extended those ankle bones so far. That is pretty cool, I think. They also have humongous feet. <laughs> Not all frogs have tremendously big feet, but many, many, many of them do, and the ones that really hop definitely do. 
Um, so what I, what I mean by that is like many times bigger than their hands. So instead of giving you six, I just wanted to give you one because all these adaptations are around the jumping locomotion of frogs. Giving you some uh, anatomical terminology too for when you talk about frog skeletons. All right, let's talk about reptiles now. So here's our herpetological reptiles without the birds included. One species of Tuatara and that clade Rhynchocephalia that again has been around since the Triassic. 340 some species of turtles today, maybe 27, maybe 26 species of crocs today. That includes things like alligators and caimans and that count. So you can see not all that diverse. And then a huge number of squamates. So all the lizards, and we're gonna talk about it later in class, the interrelationships of those groups. Some of the lizards are closer to snakes. Snakes are deeply nested within the animals you guys would call lizards. A great example is things like an iguana and a cobra are more closely related than either one is to like a gecko. So lizards are paraphyletic relative to snakes, but that whole group is called squamata. And that's a lot of species, way more than there are frogs. 10,500 species of squamates right now alive. That's a lot. You guys know, though, that herpetology, as defined as these guys only, is paraphyletic. So, of course, all the living dinosaurs, a.k.a. The, the birds, are part of extant reptilian diversity, living reptilian diversity. And they are the most speciose clade of tetrapods with almost 11,000 species of birds today. And so you have your archosauromorphs on the bottom of this slide and your lepidosauromorphs that are living on the top of this slide. Really wild, right? 11,000 species, 27, one. These are very, very different numbers when it comes to biodiversity. Let's get into the anatomy here. Here's that interrelationships of modern reptiles. So we're not using words like archosauromorpha and lepidosauromorpha. We can use the crown groups, lepidosauria on the right, archosauria on the left, turtles sort of floating, <laughs> but still definitely on the archosaur side of things. And so you guys already got a lot of these features in class, the diapsid skull condition for the living reptiles, the hemipenes, I hope you remember the double penises, for the <laughs> lepidosaurs, all the interesting things about turtles, a plastron, a carapace, loss of their teeth. Those are uh, some morphies you've already got. Now I'm gonna add a couple more here. The first I'll add is for the squamates. So squamata is an order. Like I said, it's the group, the monophyletic group that contains all the living animals today that are called lizards and the snakes, that's squamata. And so I have one feature for you guys, for squ squamates, that I think is really remarkable and is certainly a big part of their adaptive radiation and why there's so many of them today. And it's how they work with their jaws, how they articulate their jaws. So it's this condition that's called streptostyle. And so you guys might remember that the way all amniotes ancestrally articulate their jaws is a quadrate bone in the skull and an articular bone in the lower jaw. You guys have a quadrant in articular right now in your middle ear that you're using me, using, that you're hearing me with. But these reptiles have a bone in the skull called the quadrate and a bone in the lower jaw called an articular. Here's a lepidosaur that's not a squamate. That's the tuatara. And you can see there's a bone called the quadratajugal that holds the quadrate. They're all connected to each other. It's braced. Every single squamate has a different level of freedom in how the quadrate moves. This chameleon, you can see there's no bone that goes from the cheek back to the quadrate. It's open ventrally, it's open on the bottom. So the quadrate can actually move a little bit. That gives, as it goes into the lower jaw, more flexibility for the jaw. So you can see the chameleon has a little bit of movement, a little bit of degrees of freedom. The gecko's got quite a bit. Jaw, jaw bones in the head, jaw bones in the lower jaw, as, sorry, skull bones, jaw bones, and the hinge itself allow the gecko to really open its mouth wide. And then snakes are easily the most extreme example. This giant green rod right here is the quadrate in snakes. And you can see that it is like free to do anything at once. Unlike that tuatara, where that's just one bone that's braced to many other bones, in the snake, that quadrate can move. So you guys have probably seen snakes open their mouths and swallow, you know, baby zebras and stuff because they can open their jaws so wide. Look at the structure of the snake's skull and how much movement there is. It's basically reverting to like a brain case with giant teeth and then everything else is just a suspension system. It's really cool. Very different from the tuatara, which has that very ancient constrained 
kind of just open your jaws kind of skull. So there's a lot of specialized terminology that all these different animals have. You guys should be content to know that the squamates have streptostylic jaws. The quadrate is free to move. It allows them to open their jaws pretty wide. There's a frilled lizard screaming at somebody. You can see it opening its jaws nice and wide. So that's some squamate stuff for you guys to think about. Now let's go over here to the archosaur side of things. Talk a little bit about turtles. This is something we didn't have time for in our archosaur morph lecture when we talked about turtle origins. But I want to talk about the turtle's shell. Turtle shells are so wild. I'll let you take a minute, look at this. This is a, a carapace of a turtle upside down. So you're looking at the top of it. You guys saw in class that they have a carapace that's made of their vertebrae and made of their ribs. So a turtle's vertebral column and its rib cage is what becomes the carapace. And what I thought would be fun to do was to show you guys all the different ways that we have figured out different parts of the shell evolve. What's challenging is we can do the work that's mostly done through developmental biology, people like looking at turtle embryos to see which bones become which parts of the shell. It's really recent work. For a long time, there were parts of the turtle shell, which I'll talk about in a second, that everyone's like, I don't really know where that one came from because it's not a vertebra and it's not a rib. But what's really cool is you guys saw in the Triassic, some of those first turtles have no shell, but they kind of have thick ribs. You remember this? Some of these turtles have a plastron, but their back looks normal. Some of them have really expanded ribs that are starting to fuse into a carapace. And then one of them, Perganachilles, has a full-on turtle shell. So the order that this shell came together is, at this point in the fossil record, really unclear. But what we can do is use things like developmental biology of the living turtle biodiversity, look at embryos of little baby turtles today, and figure out which bones do make the shell. That helps us inform how we go out into the fossil record and look for the actual specimens that would show us in the Triassic what must have happened. I think it's very cool. This is upsetting and it's meant to be. Why don't you take a second, talk to your neighbors about this. What is this trying to show you? <laughs> There's way worse ones in this book. <laughs> There's way worse ones? Oh yeah. This is a really, really, really good time to remind you guys that almost all the parts of a turtle are homologous with your parts. Like it doesn't have a very different skeleton than you in terms of the identities of the bones. It obviously does a different thing with its skeleton than you do, but there aren't very many, there are a couple, but there aren't very many bones that turtle has that you don't have. <laughs> yeah, I was about to up with this. Welcome to Turtles. Here's a cute man turtle. This is like a textbook. It's a fantastic book. It's no well, come on now. You gotta like get your comparative anatomy on. I love it. Is this in your library? <laughs> oh, actually, it's not. I don't know. But, like, is this the next thing I'm checking out? <laughs> Returning the set of the. All right, so what is this supposed to be a picture of? What is this? What is this lovely book trying to show you? This is a teenage ninja turtle. <laughs> I can't tell. I don't think anybody would like them if this is what they looked like. <laughs> so, what is this? What is this showing you? Just somebody put it into words. Homology. homology right our skeleton turned into a turtle shell because you guys know turtles you've seen them your whole life pretty much they don't seem odd to you but they certainly are odd so their ribs and their vertebrae are the dominant parts of their shell the carapace and the plastron on the top and the bottom but there's weird things like their whole shoulder girdle they have a scapula it's inside the shell so what if your shoulder blade was inside your ribs how does that happen their pelvis is deeply inside there. You guys are going to see it in lab. You saw it when we did osteology. Their pelvis is fused on the inside to the shell, which is made of their ribs. That's what this guy's up to. <laughs> Everybody knows that turtles go like this with their heads, and you guys think it's cute. Well, they're coming out of their own rib cage when they do that. 
It's fantastic. I like this very, very much. And I'm glad it was effective. You all reacted negatively, which is, I guess, what I wanted. <laughs> so let's talk about the turtle shell and where it actually comes from. So what you're going to see on these next few slides, uh, these are made by one of my grad students, uh, and I think it's fantastic. So this is the carapace in dorsal view of a, like just a pond turtle today. Here's a plastron in ventral view, again, just like a pond turtle today. There's all the bones kind of labeled or at least identified or delineated in the two pieces of the shell. Meanwhile, up here, here's an early amniote, uh, Cactorhinus. And there's a skeleton that has all the parts where they're supposed to be, and I'm sure it doesn't offend you at all. And then right here, we didn't talk about them too much in the pectoral girdle. There's some midline elements that a lot of these early tetrapods have, and a lot of reptiles still have. There's a scapula and a coracoid. You guys still have a scapula. And there's a clavicle. You guys still have a clavicle. Remember, that's a dermal bone. This bone called an interclavicle that goes down the middle. I just have this picture of the pectoral girdle in ventral view, because you're not going to be able to see this too well on this diagram. I hope that makes sense. So here's the different parts of a turtle shell, the names for the anatomy of a turtle shell. There's the carapace, there's the plastron. So the costals, the costals are the side parts of a turtle shell. So the parts on the carapace that are uh, paramedian, they're off to the side of the midline. And those are homologous with the ribs. So the red ribs up there in that captorinid are showing us the bones that are homologous with that part of a turtle shell. Nobody's disturbed, it's definitely fine. <laughs> the neurals are the pieces of the turtle shell on the carapace that go down the midline. The neurals are homologous with vertebrae. They are highly derived vertebrae. So far, so good. Some of those Triassic animals have this kind of thing happening. It's not that crazy. This one's real crazy. There is a midline bone on the turtle shell that is right here above the head. When a turtle looks around, the little thing that has hooks on it and like a big Galapagos tortoise is one, one element. It's on the midline of a turtle shell today. And it's only in the last five, what, eight years now that developmental biologists have shown that one of those bones that's in the shoulder girdle, so there's one on each side called the clithrum, a shoulder girdle bone in early reptiles, comes up during a turtle's embryonic development, these two little ossification centers, they go above the neck, they merge together, and this one weirdo bone, the nuchal, is part of the shoulder girdle. Even though it's a midline element, there's not two of them, and it's on the back of the animal. This was a big deal. You guys can put it into Google Scholar. You'll see papers from the 2000s, from the 90s, where everyone's like, I can't figure out what the nuchal is, because it's not part of the vertebral column. Well, it's part of the shoulder girdle. That's a little bit wacky. The gastralia of any reptile, which are these belly ribs that are usually cartilaginous, that's what makes up a large part of the plastron, the part of the plastron called the plurals. They're in pink. Most of that structure is also ribs. So pink and red are ribs. Blue is the backbone. Green is a crazy shoulder situation. Maybe pleasingly, this bone called the entoplastron, which has like a vague teardrop diamond shape on turtle shells, is the interclavicle that lots of other reptiles have on the midline of their body, kind of where you guys have a sternum. That's not upsetting. I think we can all say that's fine. And then also, not upsettingly, the two bones called epiplastra, which are paired elements on the anterior part of the ventral shell, aka the plastron, come from the clavicles. So you have belly ribs and two shoulder elements, making up the plurals, entoplastron and epiplastra of the plastron. That kind of makes sense. And then your carapace is made from costals, from ribs, neurals, from vertebrae, and a nuchal bone from the clithrum. That to me is super incredible because for a long time, like I said, nobody knew where this one came from. All of these epi, uh, oh gosh, these ones are called piggles, they're from the tail, which is great, or piggles. All these ones around the edge are novel bones that only turtles have, just dermal ossifications that are brand new only for them. And so that's very cool. I think one of the achievements of biology is taking fossils, taking comparative anatomy, and now taking things like developmental biology and showing us how such a wild morphology as this animal that has its shell can come out of seemingly nothing. These homologies, identities are super remarkable. And I just like you guys to have them and have these words. So when you're looking at turtle shells in the lab today, I hope you will look back on this. 
Any questions about this stuff? What's a soft shell turtle? What what is a soft shell turtle? Yeah. Soft shell turtle is a type of turtle. We'll talk about them Thursday after spring break. Um, they don't have literally, well, they do have soft shells on the edges. They don't have a fully ossified carapace. It's like I'll show you a picture later. I'll put it up. Soft shell turtles are really a thing. There's this, there's one from Southeast Asia that I always think is such a funny animal when it's out of the water because like the gravity of its shell, its shell's soft, so it's just like it rests. I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. They are a completely kind of normal crown turtle. Yeah. All right. Our last reptile group, because we're absolutely not talking about birds today, is the crocodiles. Crocodiles are not, I don't think given the due they deserve, uh, besides being awesome, scary, cartoon, awesome animals. I said awesome twice on purpose. Crocodiles have a vibe. You guys know what crocodiles are. So do me a favor, talk to each other. How would you characterize crocodilians? I'm telling you, and all the genetics are telling you, and all the anatomy is telling you, and all the fossils are telling you that these animals are the closest living relatives of birds. So tell me, how would you characterize crocodilians? What's their deal? So I spent a couple minutes on this. Their crocodileness. Bringing over and just rips off. Oh, okay. And he's like totally, he's like doesn't care. He's, you know, they're just talking around looking oh, at the fish. They're on land and he just oh, yeah. got me. Yeah. 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 And then the other frogs was yeah. 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 He's not really moving. Yeah, they're really <laughs> <laughs> younger brother. When they're when they're moving, <laughs> they don't move quite long enough to spray. They move faster than you would expect. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Characterize crocodilians. They're archosaurs. Love that. <laughs> so what? So how would we characterize them though? Like just out there on the landscape. You're on your jungle walk. You're on your safari. What's up with crocodiles? What's that? Armored. Armored. Cool. What else? Crawling gait. Legs and arms out like this. What else? Semi-aquatic. What's that? Semi-aquatic. Semi Murder logs, as they're often referred to as. What else? A powerful jaw. Powerful jaws. If I was to look at one for the first time and not really know much about it, is I would assume that it's probably pretty um, that it's that it's like an apex predator. You, okay, that's a really fun thing to do. Imagine you've never seen one before and someone shows you one. Are you like? It looks dangerous. It looks dangerous. 
These are also usually, though not always, of course, pretty large animals. There's only a couple uh, of the crocodilian species that are like your size or smaller as adults. There's a couple, but not many. Some of them are, of course, quite huge. All right, so aquatic, apex predators, armored, sprawly legs. This is great stuff. I agree with you. No one said one of the things that I wondered if somebody would say, which is like ancient and like, oh, they've been around forever. Sharks have been around since older than trees. You guys now know a little bit more about that statement and all the asterisks you might put on that. This is the other group of big predatory animals, I think, on this planet that people are like, oh, yeah, those are dinosaurs. They're what I mean when I say dinosaurs. Before all those dork scientists found feathers and told me birds were dinosaurs, I thought this was a dinosaur. Big mouth, full of teeth, scaly skin, armor, bad attitude. Big, big thing. You guys, of course, know that these organisms are spectacularly interesting. They're excellent parents. They have all kinds of interesting mating displays. They are today, 100% carnivorous. And in a lot of ways, they can stand in for the fossil record because if you go back 90 million years, there's animals that do look a lot like those two crocodiles on the landscape. So there's something interesting to tease out there. What I think is important is that it is absolutely not their default condition. I hope you remember just last week when you saw the earliest Triassic crocodilomorphs were those long-legged, like, little greyhound guys. So this is a figure that I will not talk too much about because <laughs> we're going to have presentations later in this class. But I want you guys to appreciate this. Jurassic, Cretaceous, Paleogene, Neogene, that's you and me sitting right here. This black bar, black means semi-aquatic, green means terrestrial, blue means living in the oceans. This is how crocodiles look in their evolutionary history. As you can see in the Jurassic, this is all terrestrial animals, and a couple times going into the oceans. There's some that are looking like ours, swimming around in lakes and rivers and grabbing poor dinosaurs and poor other things to eat them, just like they do to wildebeest right there. But you can see there's other lineages of crocodiles that live almost to today that are not at all murder logs. <laughs> a lot of terrestrial animals all through the Jurassic, all through the Cretaceous, all through the Paleogene, which we haven't talked about yet, and into the Neogene. On this planet, there are terrestrial, running, standing up on the surface of the earth, crocodiles. So the idea of them sitting by the side of the lake with all their armor, coming to get you, waiting for you to take a drink, that's one ecology they have. And we just happen to live in a world where that's the only one that's left. And so all the things that make crocodiles look like other lizards and salamanders, sprawling legs and stuff, that's secondary for the group that we have now. All this part of the tree, they stand upright. You guys saw some of those Pseudosuchians, they stand upright. All the early crocodilomorphs stand upright. The sprawly that they do now is a secondary thing. That's really, really, really crazy. We're gonna talk a lot more about crocs in lecture, of course. There's some at the museum. We're gonna have presentations about crocs. So don't worry. But I just like you to think about it and realize that sometimes the living forms do betray themselves. So here's this Florida gator crossing a lawn. And so when it wants to, it can do what's called a high walk where it stands up, it doesn't sprawl. It's a struggle for these guys, especially that big one. But he can walk almost parasagically. Look how the legs move. So the muscles from when this animal's ancestors were upright are all still there. And so when it needs to, it can absolutely do that. Now that is a classic 1950s dinosaur tail drag, no question. <laughs> Dinosaurs don't do that, but big crocs for sure do. The better example is a small crocodile from the Pacific area. And only small crocodiles are small enough to do this, but they can gallop when they chase things. And so that, even though it's a crocodile, does show you, uh, there's some like ancestry hints sometimes. That animal's flexing its spine dorsoventrally, top to bottom, which is how mammals run and how no reptiles run today, except for that crocodile when you stare it or when it's doing something. And so there are ways these animals can show their ancestry, even though today they're secondarily adapted to be aquatic predators. So I've got two synapomorphies for you for the living crocodiles. This is like today's crocodilia. Everything I'm showing you are snake morphies for the modern clades. 
One is a secondary palate. So not only are crocodilians pretty good parents, just like mammals, crocodiles have a secondary palate like mammals do. If you guys remember, one of the things you saw in mammal evolution was instead of the external nares hole going down into your mouth when you breathe in, which is what happens in like an amphibian and a lot of reptiles, mammals have a closure. The maxillae meet each other on the midline on the roof of your mouth. And so your air goes to your throat when your mouth is shut. It doesn't go into your mouth, it goes back all the way. Crocodiles, for totally different reasons, have the same adaptations. The air goes in a hole, their nostril, and then travels under, on top of this palate, this is a skull and ventral view, to these holes that are at the back of the throat. That internal nares, the quane, that's where it is in a crocodile that's really similar to where it is in you. You have a hard palate, you can feel it with your tongue, and then a soft palate. Croc has a hard palate all the way back to those holes. So here's the air passage in the crocodilian skull. And that means they do things like this. That crocodile is using its tongue to close off its throat. It can still breathe underwater. It can still breathe with its mouth open, waiting for a fish or an antelope to make a mistake. That's really fun. This hard secondary palate is only in mammals and only in crocodiles. It's a very cool, very cool thing. The other feature I have, the other snake morphia I have for crocs is a lot like the one I gave you for frogs. It's just a million things all together instead of giving you a bunch. And that's their body plans they all share today. I'm calling it their aquatic ambush bow plan, which is just a fancy German way of saying body plan. So they all kind of have that look. Just like you guys know a bird when you see a bird, you know a frog when you see a frog, you tend to know a gator or a croc when you see it. There's a lot of adaptations they share for that swimming, predaceous lifestyle. Their eyes and their snouts are on the top of their skulls. That means they can raise up and only have their vision and their ability to breathe. That skull is very long. You can do simple measurements, right? Top to bottom versus front to back of a skull. Crocs all have long and low skulls. Although this is, of course, interesting variety within the clade. A humongous tail, huge development of those caudal muscles. We haven't talked about it. I don't know if we will talk about it, but a lot of the way dinosaurs move is muscles in their tails insert on their femora to have powerful leg movement. Crocodiles show us also how powerful muscles in the tail can be rooted to the hips and the legs. And in this case, the tail's moving to propel the animal. In dinosaurs, the muscles are pulling the legs because the animal's still on land walking around. I always think it's cool. And a thing that makes them scary, like shark fin style, is that there's osteoderms, pieces of armor in the skin that actually extend the surface area of these big muscular tails. Crocodiles have like a further elongation of their tail's profile from those osteoderms. It's not just the flat side and the big muscles. The actual armor helps them like skull through the water. Most of them have some kind of webbing in their toes, which is pretty fun. So when they kick, when they steer, if you guys have never seen it, go ahead and look up YouTube, like crocodiles moving around underwater. And so a lot of the stuff that looks scary on the surface is very fun when you can see what they're actually doing, because they'll swim really fast and then they'll go like this and slow themselves down. But on the surface, it just looks like they're slowing down. <laughs> they have a lot of control. And there's a cool gif just to show you how capable they are of doing cool stuff. I like the one that doesn't care. So point being, uh, all these herps are herps, but it's super weird and bizarre that they're all together because you guys saw those turtle shells, thinking about these crocs evolution, thinking about frogs and all the ways they've changed their skeletons. Herps are crazy, crazy diverse. If you look, can you see the bottom of the pelvis there? It's kind of awesome yeah. between those flappy legs. <laughs> all right, that's all I have for you guys lecture wise. Um, the rest of today is just you doing the lab. To orient you a little bit, we got frogs up here, we got big amphibians in the back, and then crocodiles, turtles, and then up here are all the lapinosaurs. I brought a tuatara, a couple snakes, and a bunch of lizards. Enjoy yourself. Um, I'm like, I'm right here. <laughs> Um, can I take a couple slides back? Oh, sure. Just to be. Yeah, wait, let me stop. Uh, the one right before that. Yeah.